This video is made possible by Lou Merritt, a better way to do college. Find out more at loumerritcom slash brainfood or follow the link in the description below. More about Lou Merritt later in this video. In mid-2005, players logging on to play the popular online multiplayer game World of Warcraft found themselves besieged by a virulent viral plague nobody knew how to cure or effectively combat. For around a month, the plague spread unchecked through the Kingdom of Azeroth, killing tens of thousands of players as characters and intriguing experts who've since used the plague as a model for real-world bioterrorism and epidemics. Known as the Corrupted Blood Incident, the plague's genesis can be traced to a September 13th World of Warcraft update that introduced a new dungeon and super boss for high-level players in order to test their mettle. This boss was an ancient blood god called Hacker the Soul Flayer. While felling the powerful foe, any player who got too close to Hekar while he was in the throes of death would be afflicted with a potent debuff called Corrupted Blood, which, in addition to considerably initially damaging the player, would cause additional damage every two seconds for a total of ten seconds. As an idea of how dangerous this was, it's noted that this single attack could near instantly kill any low-level player. On top of this, the debuff was also highly contagious and could be spread to any nearby player if they similarly got too close while a given player was still being affected by it. Further, because of the way the debuff worked, a player who survived an initial infection could be reinfected by an ally and in turn pass the debuff on to others, with this process potentially being repeated until the player either died or left the vicinity of Hakkar's corpse or another player who was infected. Now, the original intention on behalf of Blizzard, the makers of World of Warcraft, was for this debuff to be limited exclusively to the encounter with Hakkar and, by extension, the special high-level dungeon that he resided in. However, as with many plagues, it turns out there was a very simple way to spread this to the wider world, and that was animals. You see, players, and eventually Blizzard, realized that a character's pet could similarly be infected with corrupted blood, and it didn't take long for players to notice that this could be spread to other places if they dismissed their pet within a few seconds of it being infected. And why was this important? Well, that's because the player could then recall the still infected pet at any time, including, say, in the middle of a populated city. Blizzard have since confirmed that they have no idea who the virtual patient zero was or if the initial spread was intentional or just by accident. Whoever it was, the first server known to be struck by the virtual plague was the Realm of Archimond, which was devastated when an unknown player unleashed the corrupted blood on the city of Iron Forge. Because, as previously noted, those afflicted with corrupted blood would immediately receive significant damage, corrupted blood was potent enough to outright kill some low-level players, while many higher-level characters were killed by the resulting drip feed of damage caused by the debuff's secondary effect. You might think that this would burn itself out quickly with no widespread damage, but, well, here's the thing. While NPCs, that's non-player characters, could be afflicted with corrupted blood, because they couldn't die, they would act as carriers of the disease, facilitating the spread of the plague and ensuring that after everyone died and respawned, the reaping of life would begin anew. For days afterwards, cities throughout Archimond were littered with skeletons. Further, the news of the plague sweeping across the server caused quite the commotion in the sphere of gaming and tech journalism. Initially, most assumed that the plague was an in-game event of some kind, perhaps to celebrate the recent update, and some even applauded Blizzard for their ingenuity in creating what one player described as the first proper world event ever seen in World of Warcraft. Internally, however, Blizzard employees were baffled by the spread of the virtual disease, and it took some time to figure out that Hakar the Blood God was responsible for the untold death and destruction being rained down upon the denizens of Azeroth. During this time, the plague spread to other servers, and before long, entire cities were devoid of life, the streets paved with the bones of the dead. Frustrated with a lack of communication from Blizzard, as Blizzard's chief of staff, Shane DeBerry, would later discuss, without instruction, players began setting up their own quarantines around major population centers in order to halt the spread of the plague. In addition, higher-level players, who were capable of surviving the effects of the corrupted blood, began venturing into the cities to seek out clues as to what was going on, while lower-level players, who couldn't, would stand guard outside, warning approaching players not to enter the infected area. In addition, characters who had healing magic rushed in to help in any way they could, working in shifts to heal infected players and stem the flow of virtual blood. Again, nobody told anyone to do this. The players did it of their own volition, and by the time Blizzard released an official statement about the plague that also asked players to voluntarily quarantine themselves while they fixed the problem, players in the most severely infected areas 
they'd already done that. Unfortunately for the players, Blizzard's first few attempts to put a stop to the plague failed spectacularly thanks to a small but equally as dedicated subsection of players who actively resisted Blizzard's attempts to eradicate the plague. This began a game of cat and mouse between Blizzard and players who wanted to keep spreading the disease, apparently just for their own amusements. Just like in real life, apparently some people love to watch the world burn. A shadowy cabal of players intent on spreading the plague further and further spent their time hiding in the mountains, periodically returning to cities to break quarantines and ensure NPCs remained infected, as well as hopping between realms to avoid server purges. All in all, it took Blizzard around a month to fully rid the game of the plague, and they were forced to quite literally reset the entire world, as well as issue a patch to get rid of the bug that allowed pets to spread the disease beyond its intended original boundary. Along with being frankly quite an amazing story, the Corrupted Blood Incident has endlessly intrigued experts on infectious diseases and bioterrorism who feel the reactions of players and Blizzard can serve as a useful model for real-world pandemics and terrorist attacks. For example, in 2008, epidemiologist Nina H. Pfefferman noted that the Corrupted Blood Incident closely, though not perfectly, mirrored a real-world epidemic. She pointed to the fact that people initially ignored Blizzard's warnings to stay away from populated areas, and the fact that opportunistic players quickly used the situation to break long-held in-game taboos. These are all quite similar to how real people react in a comparable real-world situation. Pfefferman also noted that the origins of the corrupted blood plague and its spread were eerily similar to modern epidemics, noting of the virtual disease. It originated in a remote, uninhabited region and was carried by travelers to urban centers. Hosts were both human and animal, such as with avian flu. It was spread by close spatial contact, and there were asymptomatic individuals, in this case, the invulnerable NPCs. Likewise, terrorism experts have also noted that there could be some value in studying the response of players to the corrupted blood incident. For example, in a 2008 interview with Wired, Charles Blair of the Center for Terrorism and Intelligence Studies explained that the game and the mentality of players who willingly engaged in spreading a virtual plague could potentially be used to study how terrorist cells form and operate. As to why players' behavior in many cases mimicked real life, Dr. Sherry Turkle of MIT noted, It's not that it's not part of your real life just because it's happening on the screen. It becomes integrated into really what you do every day. And so when you have loss of that part of your life that was involved in the habits and the rituals and the daily life, it's very traumatic. It is play, but it's very serious play. Unsurprisingly, Blizzard weren't happy about these types of comparisons, releasing a statement that read in part, As we have always stated, World of Warcraft is first and foremost a game. It's never been designed to mirror reality or anything in the real world. Now, computer games are fun and all, but sometimes it's important to go out there and do things in the real world, and that's where today's sponsor, Lou Merrick, comes in. Career-wise, college, pretty important. I think everybody knows that college leads to better career outcomes, but it also comes with a lot of baggage. You know, there's plenty of wasted time with all those unnecessary credits, or maybe you're just worried that you'll end up in so much debt that you'll be playing World of Warcraft in your parents' basement forever. Look, whatever stage you are at in life, college especially, without all the crazy debt can be a great way to take the next step. I went to university, that's what we call college in the UK, and it's not exactly been a straight path to where I am now, but the skills and knowledge that I got through all that academic stuff is really a big part of what led me to being here. Or maybe you already took a crack at college and you didn't quite finish for whatever reason. But look, whatever your situation, Lumeric can be a great step to take right now. So right now you're probably thinking, well that's cool, Simon, what exactly is Lumeric? What does it actually do? Well, with Lumeric you get a free consult about about how long and how much it's going to cost you to get a degree or finish that existing degree. They're going to show you how much it will cost, what classes you need to take to graduate as fast as possible, and you have even got classes that you can take online. And Blue Merit, it's not some sort of weird online university where you buy a useless piece of paper. These are great degrees from great universities. I indeed recognized several of the names that they work with, and I'm not exactly an expert on US colleges. So don't get screwed over by student loans and go to lumerit.com forward slash slash brain food. There's also a link in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.